Here we go. One of the dishes Texas is known for. Absolutely delicious. Today I'm going to be making chicken fried steak. Chicken fried steak. Oh, it's just flat delicious. Crispy, crunchy batter on the outside of a good chunk of beef. Fried up just perfect and topped with a cream gravy. That's good eating right there. Before we get into this dish though, I want to respond to some of my viewers. Uh, I put out a chicken fried steak my very first season. It was one of the earliest dishes I did. It's garnered almost, uh, well, no, in fact, it's about 200,000 views now. Um, so it's done very well. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to do a updated version of that same recipe. So we have a little more modern video and it'll be a little better. But I had a lot of responses to that video and the responses I got from like Germany, you know, and, and other places in Europe, uh, Great Britain, people were constantly asking one question. Why do you call it chicken fried if it's beef? Okay, so here's the answer to that. Chicken fried in the Southern United States is how we refer to a type of battering technique. That battering technique is a dry batter technique where we use layering, uh, the, you know, one dry layer, a wet layer, and another dry layer, and then we fry it up and it produces a really crispy, crunchy batter. And that's how we do our chicken. And I think that's how that term began. Uh, people would just call it chicken fried, referring to the battering technique. So that's what that means. Chicken fried steak means a dry battered steak that's fried up. And folks, it's delicious. Now, another question that came up frequently is why did you not use drippings from the pan to make your gravy? Okay, so let me explain two different things. I'm gonna make a cream gravy today. The drippings from the pan method, that's what I call country gravy. Sometimes you shallow fry something and then you take that in the pan and the oil in the pan, maybe pour off a little bit of it and put in flour and then put in some milk and that is what we call a country gravy. It's delicious, but that's not what we're doing today. You know, if I was making uh, sausage and biscuits, I would do something like that. This, what we're doing here, was we're gonna make a cream gravy, like what you'd get in a restaurant. And it's basically just a white sauce with some black pepper and salt in it. And it's delicious, especially when you make it with whole cream and butter, it jumps out at you. So we're gonna make a cream gravy for our chicken fried steak and it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, did a little research on this to find out how old the recipe is. Um, the first thing, you know, I, I already knew this, which is this is beef schnitzel, okay? Germans love their schnitzel. And this is a what's called a beef schnitzel. It's where you batter beef and fry it up. And uh, of course in the South United States, we do cream gravy with it. And um, either way, it's delicious. The Germans didn't invent it. They did not. Because um, I found accounts that went back to Rome Okay, so the Romans did a dish similar to this. And if it goes back before that, it's possible. But the thing you need to know about it, it's stuck around because it's delicious, all right? It, it, it works. So let's get in the kitchen. I'm gonna show you how to make chicken fried steak. Before we get in there, satrotter.com, my website, where you're gonna find the merchandise for Texas Cooking Today, also the recipes. And there's some other neat stuff. Got some shirts there. Now let's go make schnitzel. <laughs> the ingredients we're using today, I have over there in the pan about three quarters of an inch of peanut oil. Now I like peanut oil. It makes this dish, I think, taste really good, so I prefer it. And of course, if you're allergic to peanuts, you're out of luck on that one but any good cooking oil will work fine with this. I, I today am using an eye of the round. The two cuts I really recommend are either eye of the round or sirloin. And I like the eye of the round. It gives a good flavor for a good price and it's a nice lean cut of meat. I'm gonna be using to that some black pepper. 
I'm going to be using some salt and right over here I've got cayenne and a bottle behind it. That is actually chipotle pepper spice and I am going to try that out today just for myself. Also paprika does good. A nice chili flavor really sets this dish off and it is very good tasting. For the batter, I'm going to be using some buttermilk, which I have there. Also some flour. This is all purpose flour. And for our cream gravy, it's simple. Cream, butter, and flour. And we season it up with salt and pepper. Folks, this is an easy dish. It's a fun dish and it's delicious. So to get this started, we have to start with our beef. We need to get it cut, pounded out, and seasoned before we can go any further. Let me explain. There's a couple of different ways of tenderizing meat. Now, I'm opening up a little gadget here. This is known by the trade name uh, of a jacquard. This is a different brand, though. But what these are, this is a, a meat tenderizer that uses knives. And it's not too different from what the butcher uses if you ask him to tenderize your meat. The knives, multiple knives, you know, there's three rows of knives here. And there's a bunch of them there, folks, and they are razor sharp, okay? So you kind of got to watch out, and it's tough to clean. A brush works well. But this is a heavy spring-loaded base. So the spring-loaded base provides something of a pounding action on the meat, while these will split in between the grains of the meat, and it opens the meat fibers up a little bit. And that's how that works, all right? So mechanical tenderizer like that. And I like another method, which is just use something to pound it down with. I use a small skillet. Works great. Beat the meat down. It gets the right texture. It gives you the right thickness. And it's available in most people's kitchens. If you want one of these, get it. Try it out. They're fun. I like using mine. But I want to say this right now. It's not necessary for this. A basic thing like this will work just fine. Now let's get busy cutting our meat up and doing what we need to do. Now there's something I want to mention. Grain of the meat. Now this cut shows it so very, very well. You see these lines running lengthwise here. Those are the meat fibers. They're running lengthwise. That's what we call the grain of the meat. All right. If you look at it here, you're looking at the end of the grain of the meat. And that's what we want. We want to shorten that grain. You don't want to take this and make cuts this way because then you've got these long fibers of meat that are going to be in your chicken fried steak and it's going to make it seem tough and sinewy. You don't want that. It doesn't work well. So what we do is we make a cross cut on the meat and it shortens that fiber tremendously. And then we beat it and that breaks the meat fibers apart so that the meat doesn't shrink up as you're cooking it. That's why we do all of this extra. All right, that's the reason we don't just take a steak and then batter it up and call it good. All right, what I want to do here, I want to first remove some of this fat. Now this fat sometimes will have a layer underneath it, a connective tissue that will cause the meat to draw up and you don't want that, okay? So we're going to remove that and uh, that's one of the things, you know, about this cut. It's extremely lean and it lends itself so well to this very dish. So now I have a reasonable size piece of meat. This is a decent cutlet of meat for anybody and it produces a good size portion. So we're gonna go with this. I'm gonna take it and this is just to make it a little bit cleaner. It's not absolutely necessary, but I find the meat slides against the plastic easier when I'm doing this. So, bottom of the skillet, it helps to have a nice rounded edge so it doesn't cut into the meat. And you just want to use that little rounded edge to really go at it. So, another method, and we spoke about this earlier, and I want to show you how that thing works. The meat tenderizer breaks down those fibers, pulls them apart.
and you can do this quite a bit it doesn't really injure the meat at all the cutlet is still fine it'll stay together well all right so here's the thing i want my cutlet a little thinner than this so i'm still going to have to process it by pounding it down There we go. So we now have that beautiful cutlet ready to be seasoned and fried, okay? So I've got a nice half inch thick thing going on here. The meat has been really taken care of and tenderizing it and breaking it down. So I can take a less expensive cut, make it really tender this way, and it works great in a chicken fried steak. That cutlet is been pounded out and it's ready to get seasoned and the way I'm going to do mine this is simple I just do it the same way I would a steak or anything like that uh, with one exception I'm going to be using another powder over here this is a chili powder so I'm using black pepper on it and folks if you use a normal steak seasoning uh, if you're used to a steak seasoning and you're accustomed to that flavor, that's a good choice for this, by the way. I'm gonna be using this for the first time, and I'm looking forward to it. This is actually chipotle powder. Now, cayenne works good for this, paprika, ancho powder, take your pick. But I'm using a chipotle powder in the kitchen, getting used to it for the first time as a regular item. Looking forward to it. There we go. Do not worry about the heat, all right? Let me explain something to you. When you're frying, when you're deep frying, the oils that make the chili powder hot get washed out in the oil that you're frying in, okay? It just dilutes it, okay? So don't worry about that. Season it on up for flavor because the heat is gonna get washed right on out. Don't worry. Ain't that a neat thing to know? That's the reason I like to use cayenne normally uh, even though it is extremely hot as a spice, it works great when you're frying because all of that heat gets washed away and then you're just left with the delicious flavor of it. There we go. We have it heating up. I've got my thermometer in there. And this is an important thing, guys. Always, always keep thermometers in your kitchen. They are not expensive. I mean, this thing is like, I think, $8 or some ridiculous low price like that. Fry, uh, there's also a metallic type fry thermometer. I've never had problems with these, by the way. And uh, they work great. They tell you the temperature. And the other thing is, is don't heat your pan on high. You don't want to heat the oil too fast and cause an unstable heat condition on the bottom of the pan where the outer edge is maybe too hot and the center is cool or vice versa. Heat it on the same temperature you're going to fry in. I, right now I have it on a medium high temperature and I'm keeping it there. That will work throughout the entire fry session. Now I have over on the right over here my bowls that are readied up. All right, I'm getting everything ready to batter this up. So let me explain how this works. When we're doing what we call dry battering or chicken fry, we start by placing the cutlet in flour. Now, if I take this bowl and shake it, and this is where having a nice high side mixing bowls in the kitchen is really handy. Keep these things around. Just give it a shake. Now look, it's completely under the flour. All it took is a light shake. From there, when I'm ready to fry, I will take the cutlet, I'll put it in my buttermilk, completely cover it, put it back in the flour, shake it once more to cover it again like this, then straight into the oil and it's off and cooking. Folks, I'm getting everything ready for my cream gravy as the oil heats for my chicken fried steak. Now, I need to melt this butter. As soon as it's melted, I'll pour in my flour. We'll get it cooked, and that needs to turn the color of a peanut, a light tan color. And then we pour in our cream, mix it in well, and as it comes up in temperature, that forms our cream gravy, and it's delicious. After that, we season it on up, and we have some really good flavors. It's a simple thing to do. My temperature is coming on up. Right now, I'm looking at around 250 degrees. You can let this get over 325. Bring it up to 350 if you want. 
when the steak first goes in there, it's going to pull that oil temperature down and having a few degrees extra to compensate for that drop does not hurt. It will speed recovery time in the cooking. But you need a temperature at 325 to do the cooking on and so that's what we're looking for. My oil is just now hitting 325 degrees. So I now take my cutlet, I put it in the buttermilk, dredging it completely. Once it's fully covered, pull it out straight into the flour, give it another shake. Just that simple folks. Right there, you have a batter of iron. Even though it seems simple, it is actually fantastic. Right in our oil. Now, if you're using a smaller bowl for your liquid, you can nest them like this. It's a little easier in the kitchen. This, just need to keep an eye on. And I'm gonna need a place for it to drain. A pan rack like this is very handy. Put it on top of a plate or, or a pan. Uh, if you're doing one cutlet I'm, like I'm doing, a small one is good. They make these in all sizes. My butter is almost melted. I have it over a medium low flame. There we go. I'm gonna pour in the flour and stir it in. Now this is not a thick pasty roux. It is a thin runny roux and I find this technique works really well for people who haven't been in the kitchen a lot. The technique allows an easier make on the gravy without there being any lumps or anything like that. So what we do is we cook this roux up. It'll foam up here in a moment. We're going to cook it until it's the color of a peanut. My chicken fried steak is cooking up nice. The temperature is recovering. It's almost up to that 325 point we started at. It's not brown on the other side yet, so just let it cook. Now folks, how long do you cook this? That depends on the thickness of the meat, the depth of the oil, the, the altitude. There's, there's so many different factors but I find seven to 10 minutes per side is usually what gets you there. You can see the foaming starting on the bottom. This is common for this technique. We're gonna cook it like this until we can get that nice color just right. Right now it's too yellow and white. Now stir it a little bit and that way you can see the actual color. See it's changing a little bit, but it's not there yet. Let it cook some more. All right, now look at that butter change color. You see that light tan color developing? This is about another 30 seconds in the cook, and I'm ready to put in my cream. There we go. Light tan color. See that color of a peanut? That's exactly what I'm talking about right there. I'll go straight in with my cream. Now a lot of chefs will tell you just pour that in slowly and it's going to thicken up quickly and then you slowly add more and work it in. Yeah, you can do it that way, but you can also do what I just showed you. And when this comes back up in temperature, you'll see what I mean. It produces a beautiful, beautiful cream gravy. Getting seasoning down into this. I'm going to start with about a half a teaspoon of salt. This is thickening up really nice. Just as I mentioned it would. I'm gonna put some black pepper in here. And again, I'm looking for about a half a teaspoon, all right? I like a lot of black pepper in mine. I won't lie about that. I really do. When I see my cream gravy, I expect to see little black specks all, of, all, all the way through it nice and thick at this point. It's just now starting to bubble up. Folks, you don't have to cook your cream gravy that long. You just want to let it bubble for a minute or two and then, and I'm going to lower that temperature by the way to a low, and then cover it up. Once it's at the right thickness, you're there and we're just pretty much there. 
Now to keep that cream gravy from skinning over, just put a lid on it. It generally takes care of itself after that. The ingredients quantities of what we use today on the oil, as far as how much, it's simple enough. You need a three quarters of an inch to an inch of oil in the bottom of that pan. And that'll be sufficient. And that'll be dependent upon your pan as to how much oil. On your beef, Today I was using Eye of the Round and I like to use a cross cut on that Eye of the Round that is about three quarters of an inch thick and I find that very sufficient for this dish. For the spices, it was just a light dusting on both sides of the meat on your black pepper, salt, and whichever chili pepper you choose, whether it's cayenne or um, chipotle powder or whatever. You pick something out and try it out and I'm sure you'll love it. The buttermilk, I started with a pint of buttermilk, two cups. I started with two cups of flour, and that is sufficient generally for about two cutlets, all right? The cream gravy I made today, I used one pint of cream. I used six tablespoons of butter and one quarter of a cup of all-purpose flour for that. Very simple recipes all the way across. And of course, back there, I have my mash cooking up. But folks, that's a different recipe and you'll have to check that out on my channel. All right, it's time to get this thing plated up. Oh, I'm looking so forward to this. Now, folks, I love my mashed taters, and I love mashed taters when I'm doing chicken fried steak, so I think they just go together. Wow. Crust is crispy. Now we have to adorn it with a little bit of cream gravy and the whole thing is going to work out just fine. There we go. Chicken fried steak with cream gravy. I'm here to say the chipotle powder absolutely works in this dish. It was totally delicious. It's very good. Mm. Delicious flavors all the way through. I'm going to do that chipotle powder again. That was really good. All I can say is please try this recipe. Wonderful crunchy batter you get from it. Beautiful flavors that you get from it. It's a really good dish. Ladies and gentlemen, also, take a look at the website. That's uh, satrotter.com. I have a lot of stuff for Texas cooking today starting to build on there. I'm starting to get my recipes on there. This recipe is on there, okay? Larger proportions, okay? So it's designed for three to four people. I cut the proportions on this today, so it's the same recipe either way. Give it a try. Thank you very much for watching. Take a look at my channel, Texas Cooking Today. A lot of recipes there, and please enjoy your chicken fried steak.